In this short video, we're going to look at some derivative formulas. This is part one, and there'll be a subsequent video, part two, with more derivative formulas. As we have learned, you can try to calculate the derivative using the definition, even for relatively simple functions, it can be hard, it can be time consuming, and it can be error prone. For example, if I have a function, which really is not that complicated, it's simply a power with a radical and a rational function. So f of x equals 3x to the power of 17 minus 5 over radical x plus quotient 8x over 2x plus 1. I could try, and I could actually calculate with some good algebra and a lot of paper, the derivative of f using the limit definition. But boy, I would rather not. So let's look at some formulas that we can come up with without having to use the limit definition. So first of all, whenever possible, if we have a geometric interpretation, we should make use of that geometric interpretation. So anytime I see a function whose graph is a line, then I know that a line has a constant rate of change. That constant rate of change is the slope. And so the derivative of a linear function will be its slope. And as a special case, but also just thinking about on its own, if I have a constant function and its graph is a horizontal line, well then, if I'm looking at the rate of change of y with respect to x, well, y is never changing. So its rate of change should be zero. And indeed, the derivative of a constant function is zero. Now, some formulas, we don't need to go through all of the steps, but they really just come straight out of the limit definition combined with the limit laws. So for example, we have a constant multiplier rule. If we have a constant times a function, we want to take its derivative. Well, we can just take that constant and multiply it times the derivative of the function. We also get a sum rule, which would say that the derivative of the sum would be the sum of the derivatives. And the same idea with the difference rule. The sum of the, not the sum of the difference, the derivative of the difference would be the difference of the derivatives. Now, sometimes if we repeatedly apply the definition, we can start to observe a pattern. And from that pattern, we can come up with a new derivative law or derivative rule. So let's start with a simple function, f of x equals x squared, and use the definition. I'll have to expand x plus h squared. And when I do that, I find that the first term, x squared, will add out with the minus x squared. And everything that's left over at that point has a factor of h, which is good, because then I can factor an h out of the numerator. That will divide out with the h in the denominator. And then with what's left over, I can just use direct substitution. Replace the h with the 0, and I find that the derivative of x squared is 2x. OK, let's try that again with x cubed. Same pattern. I'm going to expand x plus h cubed. I see again that the first term, x cubed, is going to add out with the minus x cubed. So what's left over all has a factor of h. I factor h 
out of the numerator, which is good. That will divide out with the h in the denominator. And now I use direct substitution, replace h with 0. And I find that I, the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. All right, we can already start to see a pattern. Let's see if it's a trend. I have to have three examples to show a trend. So we'll look at f of x equals x to the power of 4. Follow the same steps. We have to expand x plus h to the power of 4. I can see that the first term, x to the power of 4, will also add out with the minus x to the power of 4, leaving only terms that have an h as a factor. So I can factor the h out of the numerator. That divides out with the h in the denominator. And then I can use direct substitution, leading to the derivative of x to the power of 4 being 4x cubed. Now, let's try to look for a pattern here. If we look at the binomial expansion of x plus 1, all raised to the power of n, for the binomial expansion of x plus 1 squared, we have x squared plus 2x plus 1. And we saw that the derivative of x squared was 2x. For x plus 1 cubed, I saw the expansion is x cubed plus 3x squared plus 3x plus 1. And the derivative of x cubed was 3x squared. And moving on to the expansion of x plus 1 to the power of 4, I found that the derivative of x to the power of 4 was 4x cubed. Now, what pattern do I notice? Well, in my binomial expansion, it's always the second term in the binomial expansion which winds up being my derivative. And that's not just a pattern that I'm observing. That makes sense based on the steps we took applying the limit definition of the derivative. Because the first term added out, the rest of the terms had a factor of h, which divided out. And then only the first term was left without another factor of h. So when I use direct substitution, the other terms became zero. And so really, it's going to be always the second term in that binomial expansion, which is my derivative. So if I were to take the derivative of x to the power of 5, then I would expect that its derivative would be 5x to the power of 4. And I could do that for just the general expansion with a general exponent of n. And so this would tell me that the derivative of x to the power of n is going to be n as the coefficient times x to the power of n minus 1. And that's what we call the power rule. Now, 
we are not going to be able to prove it in this class for general exponents, but it is true that this power rule works for any exponent, not just integers. So for example, if I had x raised to the power of pi, and I wanted to take its derivative, well, I would follow the, the power rule. I would bring pi out in front as a constant multiplier, and then my new exponent would be pi minus one. Now, it's unusual to see pi as an exponent, but what is very common is to see fractions as an exponent. Because remember, if you have a radical expression, that can be rewritten using a fractional exponent. So radical x is the same as x to the power of 1 half. And so I could use the power rule to calculate the derivative of radical x. The derivative would be 1 half as a multiplier out in front times x raised to the power of negative 1 half. I just took 1 half and subtracted 1 to get negative 1 half. I'm going to clean that up a little bit um, by changing it back into a radical. So we like to think of that as being 1 over 2 radical x. And in fact, it's probably one of those things that's worth memorizing as its own rule, because it's so common, is that we should learn that the derivative of radical x is 1 over 2 radical x. If we forget, we can always go back to the power rule, but this happens so many times, we use it so often, it's worth learning as its own rule. Let's apply the rules that we've learned in a couple of examples. The first example is just a polynomial. So our sum and difference rule says that I can really just take the derivative of each term separately. And then each term, in the first two terms, I can use the power rule. I would bring the 10 out in front. And so I have negative 320x and subtracting 1 from the exponent gives me a new exponent of 9. In the second term, I bring the 5 out in front. 5 times 2 gives me 10. Then subtract 1 from the exponent, which will give me x to the power of 4. And then the derivative of a constant is just 0. Here's another example, which is a little bit more complicated. When you first look at the example, you may say, well, wait, we don't have any rules for rational functions or for algebraic fractions. Uh, how can we uh, find the derivative? Well, in this case, we still have to do our algebra homework and uh, work this out. So I can rewrite the radical x as x to the power of 1 half. And then I divide each term by x to the power of 1 half. So then x squared divided by x to the 1 half, well, you take 2, subtract 1 half, you get 3 halves. Negative 5x over x to the 1 half, x to the power of 1 divided by x to the power of 1 half, that's x to the power of 1 half. And then here I just have 2 over x to the 1 half, and I can rewrite that as 2 times x to the negative 1 half power. Now I just have powers, and I can use my uh, sum and difference rule, along with the constant multiplier rule and the power rule, to calculate the derivative. Again, I do it one term at a time. So in the first term, 3 halves comes out in front as a multiplier. 3 halves minus 1 gives me 1 half. 1 half comes out uh, as a multiplier in the second term, and I'll have 1 half minus 1 gives me a negative 1 half 
as my new exponent. And in the third term, negative one half comes out as a multiplier. And then the new exponent is negative one half minus one, which is negative three halves. So this is a, a possible solution, but we do want to clean this up a little bit. And so we'll put it back into radical form and that gives us our final derivative as being nine halves radical x minus five over two radical x minus one over radical x cubed. So, so far, what do we have? We have that the, if you have a constant multiplier and you want to take the derivative of that constant times a function, well, that's just going to be that constant times the derivative. If I have a sum or difference, then the derivative of the sum or the difference is just going to be the sum or difference of the derivatives. And finally, our power rule, which works with any exponent. If I have x raised to the power of alpha, alpha could be any real number, then its derivative would be alpha times x raised to the power of alpha minus one. So stand by. We'll be having the next video, part two, where we'll learn more derivative rules. But already we've made considerable progress, and I hope you find these rules for derivatives useful.